Over the past number of weeks, if you've been with us, you will have heard us talking about this digital exile that we live in right now. And we've been in this series called Digital Exile, and we've been looking at what it means to be men and women who are being forced, whether we know it or not, whether we want to or not, we are being forced deeper and deeper into, digital, into a digital existence that, that actually tears us away from what God desires. It's a place that, that God didn't intend for us to be. And the reality is, is that when it comes to social media, and when it comes to media even at large, we need to be reminded over and over again that we are not the customer, that we are the product, that our attention and our time is being sold to the highest bidder. And it's also a sad truth to be reminded of that we've been choosing to self-isolate for a lot longer than the coronavirus has been a thing. And I, I don't want you to get me wrong, and I feel like I have to keep giving this caveat every single week because I want you to know I don't think technology inherently is bad. In fact, I love technology. I think it's amazing. I'm so grateful for the lives that it allows us to lead, for the relationships it allows us to forge and maintain. Many of you have met your significant other because of online dating. Some of you haven't, but you really hope it works soon. Can I get an amen? <laughs> I didn't think anyone was going to, like, call themselves out on that. But I appreciate you. Bless you. People are honking for their single friends. That's called friendship right there. What I'm not grateful for, though, is I'm not grateful for where social media and where technology overshadows real relationships, where it overshadows real friendships, when it causes anxiety because of the constant comparison with a digital version of reality that's photoshopped and staged. I want to tell you a very quick story of a good friend of mine who is a uh, social media influencer, whatever that means. But this person has uh, a lot of followers, and they've, you know, they've kind of cultivated this online weird thing that people follow them for no apparent reason. But I went over to their house, and this person had their spouse taking a picture of them. And this person was standing in the kitchen... And they were looking all cute with a little mug of coffee and staring at their feet, because that's what you do. And they had a ring light set up, and that corner of their kitchen was looking nice. I mean, they had their, they had their, their kitchen counter scrubbed. Everything was in place. They had a little fern and, of course, uh, a, a little cactus, because you have to. And what was so interesting, though, is in that corner of the house, everything was perfect and serene. But as I walked into the room, what I saw was, is right behind that camera and right behind that light was complete chaos. Their house was an absolute disaster. Their kids were losing their freaking minds. Uh, it was dirty and it was smelly and stuff was just piled up. Dishes were piled up in the sink. And I thought to myself, how ridiculous is this? How ridiculous is it that this person who has cultivated this online following is putting out this r version of reality that's not real? This version of reality that is showing something that is so incredibly fake that what you see when you log onto this person's social media profile is this beautiful picture of an exquisite kitchen, a good-looking person who looks happy and healthy and whole, but in reality, what's behind the scenes is messed up and broken and falling apart. And in that moment, I was so convicted because I thought, boy, this is so wrong. But then I also realized that in varying degrees, we all do the exact same thing, don't we? We take two or three photos. Sometimes we take 20 photos because we got to make sure that angle's just right. We got to make sure that light is just right. We write and then delete and rewrite and then delete and rewrite captions so that they're engaging and cool and, and you know, that they en encapsulate what we want to say. We, we curate the best hashtags so that we can increase our engagement. We are so worried with crafting an online image that's accepted by others that we are trading in living a real life, a messy, beautiful, real life that everybody else can relate to. And instead, we want to put out something that's shallow and empty. And I don't think that we do it on purpose, but I think that we've bought into this lie. 
the underlying theme for this whole series has been a, a, a study that Barna did worldwide looking at young people between the ages of 18 to 35 and what made them resilient disciples, what made them thrive in the culture, in the time that they live in, both here in North America and around the world. And they define resilient disciples as this, men and women who are resiliently faithful to Jesus in the face of cultural coercion and who live a vibrant life in the Spirit. So here's the problem. Here's the, here's the problem with everything that we're talking about over the last number of months. We live in a world that sees faith in Jesus Christ at best as antiquated and useless and old school. And at worst, we live in a culture and a time that sees faith in Jesus as dangerous and harmful. We also live among a barrage of opinions on everything, on everything from which fry is the best. I, I was in a heated debate the other, <laughs> I was, I don't know what you're honking for. I haven't even said anything yet. Um, I was in a heated debate the other day with somebody whether Arby's fries or McDonald's fries were better, and we all know that Arby's fries are far superior in every way. But if you scrolled one thing down, there was another debate raging on whether abortion was murder or not. You see, we live in an age right now where we are constantly attacked and barraged with all sorts of opinions and debates and questions and worries and stresses. But I want to simplify it tonight. And I want to say this, that as Christians, as men and women who decide that we want to follow Jesus, there are two things that are the cornerstones of our faith. And it's this. It's the first is to live differently than the world around us. And the second is to share our faith with those who don't yet believe. And we're going to unpack that a little bit more. But it begs these questions. How are we supposed to live lives that are resilient in the face of cultural pressure? How are we supposed to live lives that are vibrant in our spirituality, that walk in step with the Holy Spirit, and, in all caps, and live in a world that desperately wants us to conform? How do we do that? Let me say it this way. How can we be faithful to Jesus to follow his guidance and his way of living and also exist in the world around us? And this is really the crux of the digital exile. It's how do we maintain our culture and our identity as Christ followers when we are so far from home? To answer that question tonight, we're going to go all the way back in the Old Testament to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a prophet uh, that had a message, message for the Jews who were living in exile in Babylon. A very timely message for us tonight. The book of Jeremiah really explains and is the story of showing that the people of Israel were living in exile because they had begun to worship pagan gods. They had left the practices that God had laid out for them. And so God sends them into exile into a land that is not their own, a land called Babylon. And Jeremiah describes the people of Israel, especially in the beginning of the book, as uh, he, he likens them to an unfaithful wife or he likens them to rebellious children. But the important thing to recognize is that Je Jeremiah was a man whose heart was broken for the people of Israel. His heart ached that they had strayed so far from God's path. And this is really at the foundation of what we're discussing when we talk about digital exile. It's the reality that we are not meant to live in this digital world, yet we find ourselves here. We found ourselves in a place that God didn't want for us. A place that, if we're not careful, will strip us of our identity and our culture and our faith, just like the Israelites experienced while they were in Babylon. And I believe that there are a number of things that we find in the book of Jeremiah and elsewhere in the prophets and other times in Scripture where the Israelites find themselves exiled from Jerusalem and the place that, that is their home. But tonight we're going to focus on chapter 29. Because I think that in this, we unpack some things. Because in this, Jeremiah outlines at least, if not many more, but at least five things that he wants to impart and he wants to share with people living in exile. 
So we're going to go through them together. The first is this. He implores exiles to make prayer a mission. Verse 7 says this, And work for the peace and the prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. You see, Jeremiah actually encourages his readers to pray for the peace and the prosperity of the city and the country that they find themselves exiled in. In fact, if you read in the book of Daniel, you'll see that Daniel is the one who's actually living out the exile. And he takes these words from Jeremiah to heart. And we see in the book of Daniel that Daniel takes this mission of prayer and he stands firm on it and he prays and he takes care of the people around him. And it's because of D Daniel's missional prayers that actually provide him the platform to rise to the prominence that we see in Daniel, to become the right-hand man to the king of all of Babylon, to be in charge of basically everything. And, but I mean, when you hear that, that's fine, but you go, well, what does that mean for me? Well, I think it means this, that as we live in digital exile, as we live in this time where, where the line between virtual reality and reality is becoming blurred ever more each day, we make prayer a mission. We make it part of who we are. It's not just something we do at the dinner table. It's not just something we do before bed. It's not just something we do when the bottom falls out. But we become missional in our understanding of what prayer is. Let me say this, if you find yourself talking to other people about the problems in the world, about the problems in your world, about the things that are going on in your life, more than you talk to God about it, that might be an indicator that it's time to slow down and spend more time talking to our Heavenly Father. And if you're wondering what kind of things you can pray for in a missional way, I mean, there's the obvious things, but there's also these types of things. You can pray that the digital world we live in will be used for good. You can pray that people would see what it is clearly. That people would understand the digital exile that we live in clearly. And they would understand the, the pros and the cons and the good things and the bad things. You can also pray that you would begin to be a good example of how to live within a world that's not going to change anytime soon. And if it does change, it's just going to become more integrated. You see, Jeremiah makes the argument in chapter 29 that if they seek Babylon's welfare, it will actually benefit those living in exile. In fact, we see this all throughout Scripture. We see it through the nations being blessed by Abraham. We see it through the Egyptians and so many more that are saved because of Joseph's prudence as he came to power. We see it in Daniel, like we just talked about, as he uh, advocated for the lives of the pagan philosophers and as he prayed missionally for the people around him. We see it in Peter's writing in the New Testament where he talks that even though the church is being persecuted by the government, we pray for those in power. Friends, we... Oh, hey, bunny. Those things are bold. Friends, we are called to live more. We're called to live for more than ourselves. But I would take that one step further and say that we're also... We're called to pray for more than just ourselves. And I'll say this, if you find yourself in a place of your life where you are praying primarily for yourself, that's a, also a good indicator that it's time to take a step back and reassess and be called to pray for others. Because when we pray for others and we pray for those in digital exile, when we pray for this world that we live in, for good things to come, we will actually benefit from it as well. The next thing that Jeremiah says is that exiles should be faithful and holy. A clear theme of the life and the times of people living in exile throughout Scripture is this need for faithfulness towards God and towards holiness. And I can't think of a better uh, marriage of two things than for us living in a world where pornography is literally at our fingertips at every second of every day. Lust is at our fingertips every second of every day. Comparison and discontent and everything bad, greed, anger, frustration. I mean, goodness sakes, we're living in a world right now where every day you go online, you see more and more horrific things. But God calls us to something more. He calls us to be set apart. He calls us to be faithful to God and also faithful to holiness. And holiness is really just a fancy word for being different than the world around you. For being what God calls us to. 
Paul in the New Testament teaches us in Romans 12, verse 2, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. And as we find ourselves in exile, we must realize the importance of not conforming to the patterns of the world around us. It's so easy, isn't it? Instead, we stand secure in what God has done, what he's doing, and most importantly, what he's called us to do. We see this clearly in the teaching of 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, where Peter teaches us something similar. He says, And remember that the Heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. He's not even saying pray here. He's expecting that you're praying. He says, He, God, will judge or reward you according to what? To what you do. Not what you think. Not even what you say what you do. So you must live in reverent fear, I love that, in reverent fear of God during your time here as exiles. Temporary residents is what Peter says, as exiles living right now. Part of what brings us into exile, part of what separates us from the the plan and the purpose that God has for us is that we lose the map for holiness. And it's a slow slide. We begin with little things, and then over time we see ourselves further and further and further away from what God has planned for us. And so finding a way to live a holy life that's faithful to God and faithful to things like purity and holiness to be set apart is so important. The next thing that Jeremiah teaches is exile should be fruitful. I love this one, too. Jeremiah says this in verses 4 to 6. This is what the Lord of heaven's army, the God of Israel, says to all the captives he has exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. Catch this. He said, build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the food they produce. Marry and have children. Then find spouses for them so that you may have many grandchildren. Multiply. Do not dwindle away. You know, some preachers get up here and they say things like, you know what, we should just do away with technology. I mean, there's some people that go, you know, we shouldn't have smartphones. Just go back to the flip phone era. You know what? Better yet, just go back to smoke signals or whatever we used to do. You know, people go, let's just strip technology out of our lives. Let's live a Luddite. Let's become Amish. Like, cool, man. If we just go out and live in the tundra in Siberia, we're going to be happier as we, you know, take care of reindeer. And maybe, but not me. But it reminds me. Because the Israelites wanted the same thing. They just wanted to get out of exile. They just said, we hate it here. We don't like Babylon. We want Jerusalem. We want our temple. We want our worship practices. We want everything back that we used to have. But Jeremiah is telling them no. In fact, you know what? Actually, a better example is how we're all done with COVID. Right? We're all done. We're all done with this. We're done with social distancing. We're done with having to park two meters away. I'm done with with not getting to hug Mike Redekop just ridiculous, man. We're done with it. But God calls us. He says, don't be done with it. Build your homes and plan to stay because I have something to teach you right now. I've been saying from the beginning of all of this that our prayer shouldn't just be for restoration. It shouldn't just be that, God, would you make this exactly the way that it was before? No, our prayer should be, God, transform us. Make us different. Teach us the things that we need to learn. Show us the ways that we have fallen short so that we can be better because I don't want to come out the other side of COVID-19 and be exactly the same man that I was when I went in. I want to come out the other side. I want to look more like Jesus. I want to love better. I want to understand how to share the gospel in new and unique ways. I want to celebrate the fact that I had to stand up on this weird, shaky stage that I feel like I'm going to die at any second and get to preach the gospel. Jeremiah is telling the people, don't think about leaving. Stay put and bless those around you. Let me say it this way. If if Jeremiah had an Etsy store... (laughs) <laughs> Somebody loves this. If Jeremiah had an Etsy store, he would sell really nice signs that say, bloom where you're planted. Aw. That's what he would say. Bloom where you're planted. Because here's what happens. When we have that flee the exile mentality, when we have that, like, let's just get out of Dodge, man. Like, let's, let's run away from this as far as possible. What happens is, is we inadvertently surrender to the culture around us. 
Because we go, you know, we, we can't do this. And then what happens is it's a slow slide. And we start to look more and more like the world around us. The Israelites were in danger of losing their culture, their faith in God, and their identity if they didn't hold tight intentionally to the plans that God had for them. And the same is true for you and, my, you and me. So don't plan to run away. Learn how to live in this digital exile that we find ourselves in. Next, exiles must be wary, realistic, and also hopeful. Jeremiah warns the Israelites to not be tricked. Listen to this, verses 8 to 11. And if you know Jeremiah 29, 11, you know what's coming, okay? Stay with me. This is what the Lord of the heavens armies, the God of Israel says, do not let your prophets and your fortune tellers who are with you in the land of Babylon trick you. Do not listen to their dreams because they are telling you lies in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. This is what the Lord says. You will be in Babylon for 70 years, but then I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised, and I will bring you home again. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Now, I want to I wanna pick a bone real quick, so stay with me. I don't know if you were with us, maybe in the fall, we talked a little bit about tattooable verses. Things that, you know, kitschy little verses that we, we you know, that people tattoo on themselves. If you're here tonight and you've got a, you've got a verse tattooed on you, I mean, I, God bless you. i got nothing against that. Just make sure you know where that verse comes from. But Jeremiah 29, 11 gets a lot of hate. It gets a lot of hate from people that go, it wasn't written for you. It was written for the people in exile. Well, no kidding. The whole Bible was written to people who are not you. The whole Bible was written because people felt that God was speaking to them and he said to them, here, speak to your friends. Write a letter to the church in Corinth, Paul. Write a letter to Timothy. Peter, get down your pen and and paper and start writing. He said to the people of the Old Testament, write this down because this is important. So if you're here tonight, you don't believe that Jeremiah 29, 11 is for you, think again. God has a plan for you. He has a plan to not harm, but to prosper you and to bring about good things in your life. But, but... We cannot read Jeremiah 29, 11 without reading Jeremiah 29, 10, where, G- where God says to the, the people living in exile that you are going to be here for 70 years. Come on, who feels tonight that you are in exile for 70 years? You feel like maybe life isn't working out the way that you want it to. You're feeling like maybe you're frustrated and you're upset, you're anxious, you're worried, you don't know what's going on. This message is for you tonight. Because God says you are in exile. It's an acknowledgement of where you are at. But at some point, I am going to come and rescue you because I have plans to prosper you. I have plans not to harm you, but I've got plans to do something greater than you could ever imagine. And so if you're in exile right now, maybe in in a more literal sense, maybe you feel alone and broken, I want to remind you that God has a plan and a purpose, but don't gloss over the fact that you're going through hard times. Learn from it. Learn from it. You see, the reality is is that we need to be on guard. We need to check our hearts. We need to be in a place where where we don't just accept the status quo because that's what it is, but instead we press in and and, and we, we look for the truth and we do all of those things, but we also cling to the hope that God is at work, that God is going to show up. Because listen, if you look at scripture every single time that Israel was in exile, every single time God showed up. Every single time God showed up and he did something incredible. And that, that, that narrative is there for you and me. The next thing that Jeremiah says is this, exile should take epic risks to say and do what is right. I love this. If you don't know much about Jeremiah... You might not know that some scholars actually refer to Jeremiah as the weeping prophet. And the reason why they do that is because Jeremiah ne- never actually saw all the things that he was trying to tell them to do. Jeremiah was basically just bashing his head against a brick wall for his entire life. He never got to see the, the good things that God did with the people of Israel because he died. But there's an undercurrent of Jeremiah's life that we could do well to learn from. And this undercurrent is that Jeremiah was willing to tell wildly uncomfortable and unpopular truths to the Hebrew people, even when doing so could cost him his life. The reality is, friends, that when we exist in exile, when we live in this digital world that we are in right now, we have to step out and take those kinds of risks. We need to be men and women that partner with the mission of God. 
And we talked about it briefly last week, but people who have identified as resilient disciples, and not people that have self-identified, but people that check all the boxes of what it means to be a resilient disciple, have developed a dedication to do what is right regardless of the cost, who are willing to share their faith regardless of what they think might be the cost. And let me just be clear that it pays off in dividends. Not always with their circumstances. Sometimes their circumstances are really quite awful. But resilient disciples that choose to live lives that are dedicated to the mission of Christ live a more fulfilling life in every single measurable statistic. And I'm not making this up. It's real. In every way, joy, happiness, peace, lower anxiety, greater fulfillment, greater contentment, better friendships, better love lives, better relationship with God, a better prayer life that you hear from God. All of these markers, they do remarkably better than their counterparts. So if we want to live lives that are less anxious and more hopeful, if we want to live lives that are less stressed and more joyful, if we want to live lives that are less hurried and more meaningful, fighting for what's right and sharing our faith, regardless of the cost, is part of that package. So what's the point? What's the point of all of this, Luke? Get to it. I see you. It's to remind you and me who want to follow Jesus that being in exile is a high and ultimately rewarding call. Let me say it this way. This digital exile that we're existing in has a high price, but also a high payoff. Friends, we don't have to be agents of the promises and the hopes of Scripture to the people around us. We get to. We get to be men and women who carry the promises of Scripture, that carry the hope of Jesus with us everywhere we go. We get to do that. Sometimes we have to reorient our understanding because we think that it's this heavy weight. But in reality, it's this incredible privilege. And I want to say this, too. I want to say this, too. You might be feeling tonight that you're alone. But I want to point out two things. The first, look around you. There is 90 vehicles here with over 200 people that have chosen to come out and listen to some guy on a stage and worship because they believe in something bigger than themselves. And maybe you're here tonight, and you're not quite there yet. Maybe you have questions. Maybe you've been dancing around this idea of faith for a long time. I want to encourage you that maybe God brought you here for a reason. Maybe God brought you here tonight because he's not done with you. In fact, maybe he brought you here tonight because he's just getting started. And I want to encourage you with the second thing, is that in spite of the intense pressures coming at Christians in our post-Christian context, right now, today, in this very moment, millions of young, resilient disciples around the world are making a choice. They are making a choice to live a life that demonstrates a firm and a countercultural trust that God is on the move. Right now, around the world, you are not alone. Young Christians are coming to grips with how to, how to live as God's people, to embrace the power of exile, and we can too. The, the title of this message tonight is called Counterculture and Being Weird. And it's clear that we're called to live differently to the world around us. And sometimes that's easy for us to grasp. We just go, okay, like, you know, I'm not going to have premarital sex. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, do illegal drugs. Uh, you know, I'm not going to sleep with my, my, you know, my partner. I'm not going to, uh, you know, I'm not going to look at pornography. I'm, I'm going to live different than the world, Luke. And we go, that's, the, I can get my mind around that. But here's the next thing. We're called to bring hope to the people around us. In order to do that, we must, be sh we, we must be willing to share what we believe. We must be willing to share about Jesus. That's part, that's part of the equation. And I, I want to be honest with you. Of course sharing our faith is difficult. I'm not going to stand up here and say that it's not. It's so hard sometimes. In fact, here's a statistic for you. 52% of adults would consider praying out loud in public for a stranger as extremist religious behavior. 52%. And you, you might be sitting there tonight and you're thinking, oh yeah, for me to walk up to somebody in Costco who's got a limp and say, hey man, can I pray for you? That's crazy. Listen, I I've heard pastors stand on a stage with the encouragement to just, don't be weird. 
I've heard it. Don't be weird. Just be cool. Just go with the flow. Show people what you believe by the way that you act. Often they'll quote Francis of Assisi, an old Franciscan monk, where he said, preach the gospel at all times. Use words if necessary. I hate to burst your bubble. He never said that. Francis of Assisi never said those words. It's not written anywhere. It's not recorded anywhere. In fact, he likely would not have actually said that ever. A biography of Francis of Assisi that I came across said, said something entirely different of him, and I want, I want to read this. This is a quote. Francis of Assisi preached in up to five villages a day, often outdoors. In the country, Francis often spoke from a bale of straw or a granary doorway. In town, he would climb on a box or up steps in a public building. He preached to, catch this, anyone who would gather to hear this strange but fiery little preacher from Assisi. Friends, the reality is, is that the gospel message is inherently verbal. It's inherently verbal. And, and of course, I mean, can you share your faith and can you share the love of Christ with someone without preaching and being weird? For, absolutely. But if you think that just living your life uh, without ever saying anything and just thinking that people are going to go, oh, doesn't, doesn't he have a nice light inside of him? I should ask him what he believes. You're going to wait a very long time to have those conversations. A very long time. We are called to share the truth of the gospel message. That there is something worth living for. And that something is Jesus Christ. The Son of God who came to earth, who died a sinner's death, who rose from the grave so that you and I could have unfettered relationship and connection with our Heavenly Father. And eternity to live in eternity with the God who hung the very cosmos that we live in, in the universe. So listen, the goal isn't to not be weird. The goal is to share with as many people as we can the hope that's found in Jesus. Because why would you keep that to yourself? Why would you keep that to yourself? Paul writes in Romans 10 verses 14 to 15, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? And so he sends them. He says, that is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring the good news. Friends, we're living in exile. And tonight we're wrapping up this series. And we, we acknowledge that we live in a digital world that's not going anywhere. In fact, with every passing day, this digital world that we live in is going to become more and more integrated with reality. So how are we going to live lives that are worthy of the calling to be messengers who bring the good news of Jesus? And I want to I wanna suggest that that's the key. If we partner with Jesus in his mission to introduce people to the wonderful news that there's something more than this present existence, friends, we will be invigorated. We will be refreshed. We will be empowered. We will be given purpose beyond anything that we can muster ourselves. So here's the call. Be countercultural. And if people think you're weird, that's fine. It doesn't matter what people think. In fact, to be honest with you, most of you are weird all on your own. <laughs> you're a little, little less quick to honk on that one. It's not our job to save everyone. It's not our job to convince people of Jesus. It's our job to be faithful to the call. Because friends, when you share your faith and you see the light of Jesus come into someone's life, it'll change yours. So let me leave you with this question. Who can you tell this week about Jesus? Who can you share with this week about how God has impacted and changed your heart? Who is that person? Maybe somebody's popping into your mind right now. Maybe it's just a blank slate and you're really worried and you think, boy, this is a crazy sermon, man. I don't, I don't want to touch that. I'd encourage you to go home and pray about it. Because God isn't concerned with people thinking you're weird. God's concerned with you walking in step with what he has laid out for you. Maybe invite them to young adults next week. Maybe invite them to a small group. Invite them to just discuss life with you. Stop living in fear that people will think you are weird. Because God has given us this time in exile.
to rise to the occasion to sustain our identity in Jesus by living counter to culture and sometimes to just be a little bit weird. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for everyone gathered here tonight. I thank you for the lives that they represent. I thank you for that the hope that they represent. I thank you, God, that you died for each one of them. And Father, if there's somebody here tonight that maybe hasn't crossed that line of faith, that hasn't stepped out yet and said, man, I want something more than, than just this existence I'm living in, God, would you, would you empower them to just reach out whether it's to scroll to the bottom of this drive-in page and click on the How We Can Pray For You link and just send a message. and Maybe it's, maybe it's coming up and talking afterwards. Whatever it is, God, I just pray that you would move. And I pray, God, for those here that are struggling with this exile that we're existing in. Maybe it's loneliness or isolation. Maybe it's anxiety or worry about the future. Maybe it's just a general unrest about not knowing what you're calling them to. God, I pray tonight that you would speak clearly. And I pray tonight that our minds and our hearts and our eyes would be focused on you, the one who brings about your perfect and pleasing will for our lives. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, we're going we're gonna to encourage you to just sit tight as our parking people kind of guide you out. I think it's probably safe to say that that side we're going to kind of start filtering out first, and then we'll... We'll just move out as we go along. So God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you guys next week. Bye-bye.